Greetings comrades! I think you've all seen the billions of videos about how life has changed in Russia since the economic sanctions were imposed. McDonald's has been renamed, Coca-Cola is gone and it's impossible to use Spotify now. And this is where I, as a video creator, face a dilemma. On the one hand, I hate all these identical videos about which company left Russia this time. On the other hand, the audience is interested in such videos. So I decided to make a video about something I'm interested in and the impact of sanctions on it. Today we have sports on the agenda, specifically football. How has Russia reacted to the suspension of Russian clubs and national teams from international competitions? Why do many see this as a blessing for Russian football? And finally, why do FIFA take the side of Russian teams in disputes with foreign ones nowadays? I really hope I'm not the only football fan here, otherwise I'd look really stupid making this video. Why did I choose football and not just sports in general? Well, with sports it's simple, Russian national teams and athletes which are in any way associated with the state are completely banned from international competitions. The exceptions are purely individual sports, such as tennis. Daniel Medvedev spent half of his life in Monaco and the state has not been involved in his career, so it would be illogical to suspend him. And football is not only the games of national teams and clubs, it is also a huge business, which the economic sanctions against Russia should have hit first and foremost. These are multi-million dollar contracts and expensive players. And in the first weeks after the sanctions were imposed, Everyone kinda expected Russian football to collapse completely. But it turned out that everything was not so extreme. Let's start by talking about the national team competitions and then move on to the clubs. After the events of February, FIFA was dragging its feet on the decision regarding the Russian national team for quite a long time. Only when all of its potential opponents, the Poles, Czechs and Swedes in the World Cup 2022 qualifying matches declared that they would not play against Russia, did FIFA announce that it was suspending Russia from the competition. Of course, the exact wording was funny, for the sake of the safety of the players. But then again, this decision was not surprising. And in September of 2022, the same decision was reinforced by the European Football Association, UEFA. The Russian national team will not participate in the 2024 European Championship. Well, it was obvious that at least until the end of hostilities in Ukraine it would be foolish to expect anything else. As a result, the only way for the Russian national team to maintain its form were friendly matches. But it's not so easy here either. You know, of course, that Russia has great friends all over the world who always support us. North Korea, Syria, Nicaragua… The only problem is that they are not that good at football and playing against their national teams doesn't make much sense. So we had to look for friendlies elsewhere. The first country that agreed to play a match with Russia was Kyrgyzstan. This match was also nearly cancelled due to hostilities. Just a week before it was scheduled, conflict broke out on the Kyrgyzstan-Tajikistan border and it was reported that the match was going to be cancelled. But fortunately, the match was played and Russia won 2-1. Fun fact, the game happened on September 24th, and on the 21st, Vladimir Putin announced a partial mobilization in Russia. And rumor has it that five of the officials of the Russian Football Union who had traveled with the national team flatly refused to return to Russia after the match and decided to stay in sunny Bishkek for a little bit longer. The second country that, unexpectedly for many people, agreed to play Russia was Bosnia, and the match was scheduled for November in St. Petersburg. It was really a big step, because it was the first European team to do that, and it was even ready to come to Russia. Many would have expected that from Serbia, but Bosnia? People in Bosnia didn't understand it either, and almost immediately some of the key players in that country's squad said that they would not take it to the pitch against Russia. Again. There are no formal reasons why this match can't be held. UEFA allowed friendly matches with Russia. But a scandal broke out inside Bosnia anyway, and right now local football officials accuse each other of selling their country's reputation for about 200-250 thousand euros from Russia. 
Whether the match will take place we will know soon enough, but I think it is more likely not. Oh yes, another rumor that circulated this spring was that Russia would request to change its football affiliation and will leave UEFA for the Asian Football Federation. Ostensibly, they will be allowed to play in Asia for the World Cup qualifiers and there won't be any problems. Especially since there have been already precedents. Israel went the opposite route when all the Arab countries simply refused to play with their national team in the 70s. But fortunately it was decided not to do that yet. After all, if it really would not have been such a big blow for the national team, the transition from European to Asian football would have been a disaster for the clubs, a sharp decline in both prize money and the level of opponents. Now let's move on to football clubs, because here the impact of sanctions is much more multifaceted and complicated. So, February 2022. FIFA and UEFA make statements that, as in the case of the national team, they cannot ensure the safety of football matches in Russia, and therefore Russian clubs are suspended from participation in international competitions. Of course, Spartak Moscow suffered the most, as they were preparing to play in the Europa League round of 16 against Red Bull Leipzig, and even managed to find a reserve stadium in Serbia, but UEFA did not allow them to play there either. Immediately afterwards, foreign players playing in Russia were allowed to suspend their contracts with Russian clubs until July 2022, i.e. effectively for the three months until the end of the season. Many foreign players took advantage of this to go on free loans to other leagues, but by July they were obliged to return to their Russian clubs. In the summer, everyone was waiting for some concrete solutions to the problem from FIFA, but they hid their heads in the sand and only extended their previous decisions for another year, i.e. the suspension of all Russian clubs from European Cups and the possibility for players to suspend their contracts with Russian and Ukrainian clubs for a year. Everyone expected the first measure, but the second seemed very strange to many. I'll tell you why soon. First, let's talk about how Russian football clubs have adapted to the absence of European football. Well, let's be honest. Russian teams in recent years in Europe have mostly embarrassed themselves. So it's not that the Champions League and the Europa League are a giant loss in terms of results. But in terms of money, they are. Clubs get a lot of money from the Champions League and it's been a huge blow to the top teams. Add to that the fact that since this year, Russia has introduced special football fans' passports, fan ID, which were designed to bring order to the stands of the stadiums. Ultras refused to apply for the new documents, and as a result, many matches this season in Russia are held with half-empty stands. All of this has hit the budgets of top teams hard, and some have been forced for example to shut down their reserve teams playing in the second strongest division. As a replacement for the European matches, they decided to expand the National Cup, copying the format from the same Champions League. Matches on Wednesdays, groups of four teams and a playoff round. Interesting, but it's unlikely to be a long-term story. More like a one-year tournament. In addition to the financial blow from the absence of European competitions and the reduced number of fans, experts were expecting another blow from the mass exodus of foreign players. It is no secret that the Russian league was perceived by many as something similar to the Turkish one. A place where either young and talented players go for further resale, or already aging stars go for the last big contract before retiring. And allowing players to have their contracts suspended would, in theory, be hugely detrimental to those clubs that were counting on their resale. Player contracts in football are usually quite short term, and in many cases suspending them for a year effectively meant that clubs lose their players for free, if the contract was supposed to end just in June of 2023. Why pay compensation for the transfer of a player if you can just talk him into suspending his contract? And in general, who would go to Russia to play without European football? But as it turns out, it's not all so bad. Russian clubs found a way to negotiate with most of the players and virtually all the main stars of the Russian league have stayed. Neither Malcolm and Claudinho nor Quincy Promise and Victor Moses suspended their contracts or left their clubs, although they had the opportunity. In general, the players of Russian teams actually divided themselves into two categories, those who have shown noble behavior towards their clubs and those who have not. Some immediately suspended their contracts and left for other leagues, 
depriving their clubs of the opportunity to earn at least some money on their transfers. There are quite comical stories, like that of Uruguayan defender Guillermo Varela, who literally escaped from Dynamo Moscow's training ground at night, turning off his phones in order to move to Flamengo. There are also reverse stories, such as Dutch defender Glenn Bale, who, when offered by Stuttgart to break his contract with Krilly Sovetov and join them, replied that he would never do such a dirty thing to his club, and suggested that the Germans pay the proper compensation for him. Or Sebastian Szymanski and Gu Stil, who could have suspended their contracts with Russian clubs, but instead managed to convince their new clubs to pay proper money for their transfers. It wasn't actually the Russian club that suffered the most from FIFA's decision, but the Ukrainian, Shakhtar. Their whole system was based on buying inexpensive Latin Americans, developing them and selling them to Europe for big money, like Fred Fernandinho and Villian. Of course, this summer all their promising Brazilians just ran away for free, suspending their contracts with Shakhtar, and the club has sued FIFA and is demanding $50 million in compensation. Good luck to them. Overall, if we talk about the Russian league, it has not changed much. Most of the players have remained in their places, although many believe that all of the foreign players would leave, and this would free up positions for homegrown talent, which would lead to their rapid development and overall have a positive impact on the state of football in Russia. Mostly Europeans left Russian clubs, but not all of them. Although many were under serious pressure, in particular Matsei Ribus and Matthias Norman, who lost their spots in their national teams because they decided to continue their careers in Russia. This looks especially awful in the case of Ribus, who has a Russian wife and two children. Decided not to leave his family. What a jerk. The story of Anatoly Timashuk, probably the second most famous player in modern Ukrainian history after Andrei Shevchenko, is also interesting. He continues to work in the coaching staff of Zenit St. Petersburg, and for this he was deprived of all awards and titles in his home country, and was also put by Ukraine on the list of people recommended to be sanctioned by democratic countries. However, he is not the only Ukrainian who remains in Russian football. For example, the longtime captain of Yekaterinburg's Ural, Denis Kulakov, a native of the now world famous city of Izum, also did not leave and continues to lead his team on the pitch. In addition, teams have problems not only with keeping their players, but also with the execution of transfers, because financial transactions from and to Russia are now also problematic. The most notorious were the stories involving Dynamo Moscow. First, the club agreed to buy Israel's Eden Kartsev, but then it turned out they could not find any way to transfer money for him to Israel. The money simply froze in the European Correspondent Bank for a few weeks, and the transfer was cancelled. And then the same thing worked the other way. Chelsea wanted to buy Dynamo's top young talent Arsen Zaharian, but they just couldn't find a way to transfer $15 million to them in a few weeks. The problem is that money for players' transfers in England is not passed directly between clubs, but through their federation. An English club sends the money to the English Football Federation, and they transfer it to a seller in another country through Barclays Bank. So the federation accepted the money from Chelsea, but refused to transfer it to Russia. As a result, most Russian teams in this transfer window preferred to buy players either in South America or in the clubs from the Balkans and Southern Europe. The former don't care about any sanctions, as long as you pay them. The latter have also always been notorious for their willingness to find compromises when it comes to money. The situation with all the transfers is also interesting. Often the money for selling players is broken down into several tranches, which are paid over several years. And some European or rather British clubs for some reason decided that since Russia is now isolated, the rest of the money for deals that have already taken place could just not be paid. Spartak Moscow finds itself in this situation. English West Ham owed 5 million pounds for Alex Kral. The first part of the payment went through, the second part did not. West Ham are in the same situation with Russian CSKA. 8.5 million pounds for Nikola Vlasic were supposed to be received by the Russian club this summer, 
but they are again frozen in the same bank account at Barclays. But there is already a precedent which shows that the case will most likely be resolved not in the favor of the Londoners. Rostov found themselves in an identical situation, and again with the British. Norwich was six months behind on the payment of the fee for the one-year loan of Matthias Norman, 2 million euros. Rostov went to court and won. FIFA decided that there were no valid reasons for the Englishman's delay in payment. Now Norwich have less than 45 days to fulfill FIFA's decision. If the British miss the deadline, they will be subjected to sanctions, most likely prohibiting them from registering new players. Lokomotiv did the same thing in October. Italian Atalanta delayed payments for the transfer of Alexei Miranchuk. Fearing that Lokomotiv's sponsor, Russian Railways, was on the list of sanctioned companies. FIFA did not consider that to be a valid reason and threatened the Italians with sanctions if they continued to stall. To be honest, sometimes it's nice when for once sanctions are not applied against the Russians. Overall, as I said at the beginning, the situation with Russian football was not as disastrous as it seemed. It is worse for the national team. Basically, an entire generation of players won't even have a chance to qualify to the biggest international competitions. As for the clubs, yes, they have noticeably reduced their budgets, and promising European players and agent stars no longer want to go to the Russian Championship because of the political situation. But Latin Americans and players from less prestigious leagues are quite willing to consider this option even without international football. And then who knows? Maybe this situation will really catalyze growth of young Russian talent that clubs will trust more, and Russian football will see a renaissance. Well, one can only hope. Thanks for watching, and of course, I would like to specifically thank the people who support me through Patreon. Special thanks to my biggest patrons. Stake 21, Steven, Elizaveta Zakharova, Kirill Klimuk, Zeman Böse, and Giovanni Zayas. I really hope I pronounced all your names correctly. 